This session, as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to talk. It's, I, I left it very general uh, for the discussion. I didn't try to be very specific about the topic. But what we're going to talk about is, I, I call it new security strategies for digitalized, digitalized, boy, I hate that word, uh, operations. Uh, so what we're going to do is, uh, we have three panelists. Uh, going from that end, it's Kenny Mesker from Chevron, Ricky Eckhart from ExxonMobil, and Glenn Idell from BASF. And I want to thank them to begin with for participating. They're, they're, they've always been great supporters for us. Uh, to kick off the session, what I want to do is, I guess let me go do my slides here, helps. As always, I always start off by saying, visit the booths of the sponsors, because we, we really value that, you know, they're supporting us. We couldn't hold these events if we didn't have sponsors and things, so we really appreciate that. Uh, then one thing I forgot to say in the last one was, if you have your phone, please shut off your phone. And then the la other thing, I, and I wish I had said it last time, that little one that says survey up there, just to remind me, but in, if you're using the ARC app, the forum app, I assume you are because I think you needed it to get your badge. Uh, if you go to each session, up on the corner, when you look at the session, like this session, if you look in the upper right corner, you'll see a star. And it's a little survey, and it's literally two questions. As I recall, one just says, what did you think of the session? You know, one to five, or what do you think of the speakers? One to five, kind of a thing. And we really value that feedback. It helps us plan future events and things like that. And, and I got rid of the part that says, what did you think of the moderator? We don't ever ask that question. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, so we'd appreciate if you if you do that. Uh, now, with that said, what I'm going to do is just, I have a very short little presentation. And I like to do this at the beginning of, the, the intention of this session is to be a panel discussion. I'll, we, I have some questions we've talked about that I'll ask maybe to kick it off, but I really want to engage, I want the audience to get engaged in the discussion, as well as I told the panelists, they are welcome to engage with each other, that's even better, that's real good. We may even ask you know, from some votes from the floor and stuff like that. That's the nature of the session. But in order to frame it, I always put together a little presentation to begin with, so maybe five minutes or something like that. So that's what to expect here. Now, with that said, you, you saw in the, in the morning session, if you were there, that one of the big things that we see changing cybersecurity, OT cybersecurity, that's impacting it is this, digi this digital transformation that's happening in the world. Uh, and one thing, and I use this slide, which I think is on our website for this forum, and the point I was trying to make is all the kinds of things that companies are doing. And you know, from the top, I mean, there's a lot of activity connecting to the cloud, whether it's for data, there's a lot of apps being moved to the cloud. We see a lot of our clients moving apps to the cloud. Uh, and it could be anything from like an advanced process control. Usually they're non-critical, but still they put them into the cloud. So that means that that app has to get data from the systems. So oftentimes it may be closed loop, and so it might be sending information back down. So all of a sudden you're opening new connections. We see a lot of IoT devices. I think everybody has seen that. Uh, we see, as well as edge computing devices are starting to pick up in popularity. You'll see that around the event. I think there's some sessions maybe that'll talk about edge computing, which really, you know, saying having servers in the network that can support a lot of applications and things. Uh, we see a lot of companies doing AI and machine learning. Certainly that's grown a lot. We see a big pickup on digital twins. And again, I just want to highlight that means they got to get data, send data back and forth. Uh, certainly asset performance management, even it's been around for a long time. I used to actually run the group here at ARC with asset lifecycle management. Now it's become more and more of get, collecting data, analyzing it, making adjustments and things like that. Uh, even though energy transition and, and sustainability isn't necessarily a technology issue, uh, it's certainly impacting a lot of plants, which is broadening where you have to have cybersecurity concerns, which you have to do with it. A lot of distributed assets and things like that. We see a lot of innovations happening in automation technology itself. I'm sorry, I, I tend to book one way. I apologize to that side of the room that I'm ignoring you. Uh, plus the screens here. Uh, but we see a lot of automation innovations. You know, we've been supporting for years now the open process automation group and the developments that have been made there are still being pushed. We have some sessions here on that today. And 
you know, now you're really introducing a lot of new technology within the control systems. And then uh, we have a thing, one thing I see a lot is, I, it just says 21st century business processes here. But there's a lot of business processes that have been changed. Now, I think COVID accelerated that. But a lot of remote work, a lot of devices, a lot of interaction by workers with other systems and things like that. Uh, all of these things are opening up new cybersecurity problems for OT people, I think. Uh, there's in issues, I just listed a couple here. I mean, vulnerability management. You know, it's one thing to say, I know what device, one problem is now you got a lot more devices to have to manage that you didn't have before. That puts extra load on the number of people you have or you don't have. Uh, then there's also a lot of devices we see that uh, the, a lot of people call them unmanageable devices. And they're unmanageable not because you can't do something with them. It's that, you, well, that it, somebody can't do something to maintain them, but you can't do that. It's usually maintained by us, uh, by us, whoever's the vendor of those products. You have to rely on them, which introduces a whole bunch of new issues. Like you have to be more worried about service agreements than getting information from them. They don't just send you patches that you load. You have to open up pathways for them. Uh, the perimeters of facilities, I think, are certainly becoming more porous. Uh, I think there's always a big concern today with vendors. Companies will say that one of these 21st century business processes is to leverage vendors to do service on equipment. Now, all of a sudden, they say, fine, well, I'm going to put in uh, a VPN connection so that I can get at my assets. And those things, sometimes you get reports that people don't even know they're there. So there's a lot of connections opening up. Uh, and when I say hidden, I mean that the security people may not even know about it. Uh, one thing we see picking up a lot is 5G. That's going to happen. But, it's, you know, it's just different ways out of the system. So you started off by just saying the only way in or out is through this firewall, which is good. But all of a sudden now somebody comes in and they're going through 5G. So they're kind of opening a pathway that you aren't controlling. And then they're and it's connecting to a device that maybe will connect to your network. So it gets very complicated that way. Uh, and there's also a lot of more external apps and systems accessing the data. So I see another implication of digitalization. These are Sid Snitkin views, so that's why you have, uh, is, you know, the scope of cybersecurity, when I started being involved in cybersecurity, the industrial side of it, uh, it was about 11 years ago, I think. And, you know, all the discussion we were having was around patching of Windows systems, putting in firewalls, segmentation, all the stuff that you might find in the IEC 62443 spec or standards. But it was all very focused, but it was in a very controlled kind of an environment. And it was, you could draw literally circles around it and say, this is OT and this is not OT. And now I think it's broadened much more. And I think the people who are responsible for OT cybersecurity may not be responsible for securing the cloud, but you have to make sure that what you are doing is consistent. You don't want somebody in another group saying the security policies we have for this aspect of the thing, which is connecting with you, is different. So it's a much broader scope of what you have to be concerned with. Uh, and then I think the governance. You know, we saw that. haven't heard much about it lately, but I'm sure it's still there. You know, there was kind of a shift uh, with ransomware and things to where CISOs got more involved, who were primarily from the CIO's office, got more involved and they wanted to know what assets do you have. So there was a big push for visibility, but also governance. Now people are trying to push down policies. How do we deal with that? So it's a much broader issue for OT cybersecurity people. So those are challenges I see with digital, of having secure digitalized operations. Uh, and you know, this is that little model I threw up before. Uh, and I don't know why it's not clicking. You know, in essence, like I said in the, my opening presentation, in the end, I think eventually companies have to think about, I have to cover that whole spectrum, which has a lot more technologies, a lot more people and things like that. So, uh, and so the impacts it's gonna have, I think on people, processes and technologies, that's the classic analyst, I find, uh, way of breaking the world down. I know I do it. Uh, you know, from a people perspective, you're gonna need more security people with more security expertise. 
You're going to have to deal with training issues as, they, as we keep bringing in new technologies. If, you have your, if you're managing it yourself, you have to train people on those. Uh, I think likewise, as you open up facilities, something like awareness training has to become much more important because now you have these people who are actively opening up pathways for attacks on your systems who didn't know they were doing it before. Maybe they're using a device in a, in a facility to access something on the outside of the facility and they're not as conscious of stuff. There's more password protection issues and things like that. Uh, from the point of view of managing the processes and technologies used for cybersecurity management, I think uh, everybody is going to have to have more better vulnerability management tools to be able to detect threats, to detect vulnerabilities and manage them. Tighter governance, as I mentioned, and broader, as well as I think, I don't know how many people are doing it. I know it's been an ongoing thing for years. Uh, and it kind of goes along with what Mark Duck had asked earlier, you know, this thing of certification of devices and things like that. But how do you manage, I think the more systems get open, the more you have to be concerned about managing the security of your vendors and partners and stuff like that. And that is more specs and more things in specs and actually making sure that specs that you do have that have security in them are actually enforced. That whenever something is bought, it just isn't set aside because the vendor can't satisfy it. Uh, and then from a technology's perspective, I see more active defense, detection and response solutions. One thing I think is needed, and I think is because of the openness, it's a Sid Snitkin thing maybe, but is the zero trust. I think that's the only way you can really deal with these open networks, but a lot of control systems just can't support that type of technology, at least at the moment. So what do you do about that? You know, there's other ways around that you can implement zero trust in a concept, but it would be ideal if you could have the same kind of zero trust handshaking and encryption and everything else that I, maybe that one could have in an IT system. And then I, at the bottom, I have this thing, Secure Internet Access. That I just find that's an interesting one. I do hear and see more people in plants using devices in plants to access things outside the plant. And when you do that, you're just opening the door to get a compromise of that. So you have to use things like remote browser interfaces and things like that to protect against that. So those are kind of things I'm seeing. Now, OK, now, uh, now that's all I have to say on the topic. That's Sid Snitkin's view, or I will say ARC's view. Uh, now what I want to do is to, I asked each of the panelists, I sent them some information about this before. But I asked them if they want, I wanted to give them a few minutes just to kind of comment on what that's happening in their company relative to this topic, which I appreciate I've kind of framed very vaguely. <laughs> but it was intentional because it's not, it's very hard to define these things these days. You can't be too specific. Uh, specific. So I wanted to give the, each of them a little time just to make comments about what, how their company views these challenges and maybe what they're doing about it in, in strategy wise. I'm not asking for any details. So we'll start with uh, Kenny. Do you want to start first? You, no, no, wait a minute. Well, no, no. You guys are in reverse order. That's what well, I said. <laughs> on, the, on the intro slide, at the beginning, we're in that order, but now we're in a... That's oh, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> okay, because <we, laughs> that was a suggestion. We thought it would make it easy. It's just keep it in order. Well, I, I can undermine any plan. Well, he, uh, <laughs> he's in the no, right no spot. No plan survives the first contract. I, I'm in the right spot. Exactly. <laughs> 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 it's one for Exxon, right? Chevron, BASF. Yeah, that's a problem. Uh, all right, well, who wants to start? Greg. I, I can start, sure. So it's pretty easy to spiral any description of digitalization and you know where various companies are at in there. Yeah, I think, oh, I didn't want to pull your cable from the ground. <laughs> um, so re recently, most companies some sort of operational excellence philosophy program, um, some established way that they, you know, measure their excellence against both their, you know, competitors and internally. And <clears throat> I think one of the most important things you can do in this space is make sure that security is part of that, that excellence metric, right? So that's been around a long time. Um, we all have various names for it. I even saw in the, in the intro for this particular session, operational excellence was mentioned there. Um, that's almost always been safety oriented. We have a lot to 
learn from our, our safety colleagues, have been doing so for quite some time. Um, but if a company or institution has not accepted cybersecurity as part of that equation, you've, you've got some work to do because that's step one. Um, the other pieces of this are, you know, we get, this is maybe a little controversial. I don't necessarily have everybody agree with me when I say this, but typically the executive suite or the C-suite folks, they're not looking for risk reduction. They're not looking for greater cybersecurity. They're not looking for all the kind of buzzwords that we usually use. What they're really looking for is assurance. And at the end of the day, when you ask them what keeps them up at night, most of them say cybersecurity. And they have impacts in their head. What they are thinking of, what's keeping them up at night, is usually some sort of impact picture, some sort of catastrophic event, some sort of you know, reputational impacting event, some sort of financial impacting event. And I've had this conversation time and time again. That's not risk. That's, that's just the impact part. That'll never go away. You can spend $2 trillion on cybersecurity, and that picture won't go away. That's still a potential impact, no matter what. So reframing that conversation with executives has been a big part of the last you know, digital transformation five years or so. Um, getting risk and a correct picture of what that really looks like. And then I'll finish up with, uh, I recently had a conversation with a colleague that had created a 53 slide deck to try to explain all this. And I said, you know, there's really two bullets. One, one slide, two bullets really covers it all. And that is, how do you measure that your cybersecurity defenses are being deployed appropriately? How do you know that a particular action safeguard or business capability that you deploy is defending you against any particular attack? And number two, how do you measure return on investment? And it turns out that in the cyber world, that's a little bit elusive. It has been for quite some time, and we need better metrics to measure these things. If you have those metrics, if you have the ability to measure, you can start providing assurance, which is what they really want. I'll stop there. Okay. Okay, Ricky, won't be a surprise. You're in the middle and you haven't changed, so you're up. Uh, yeah. um, so Ricky Eckhart, Industrial IT Cybersecurity Manager. Um, so Sid had a slide, a, a, a couple up. Let me go that, back to it? Uh, yeah, sure, if you don't mind. <clears throat> that really articulates a lot of what we're trying to accomplish from an ExxonMobil perspective, where you had the diagram with all the yeah, convergence go going into sure. cybersecurity. So there's a tremendous opportunity that we have in front of us from a digital transformation perspective. We have organizations that have been stood up to enable the transformation of our business units, all the way from our downstream refining assets, chemicals, midstream and upstream. So a huge opportunity for the corporation so my organization in partnership with our engineering and our operations functions is to try to determine how do we enable those opportunities from a business transformation perspective by integrating digital technologies, but make sure that we have the appropriate lens of cybersecurity so that we're not only enabling capabilities to be integrated into our focus area, which is the control system and the perimeter of the control system, but we also need to preserve the integrity of that environment. We need to make sure that we have the right detection and protection capabilities in place so that we can bring in new technology without compromising the integrity of that very, very critical environment. So again, when I look at this slide, it, it resonates from an ExxonMobil perspective. We have pockets of these opportunity areas that are either in flight or being evaluated. I think one of the items that's really critically important is that bottom line, complicated security governance. Because we need to bring in the cyber experts, the engineering experts, and the business experts to have the right discussions around how do we enable this so we can get the value from the transformation activities, but with the right lens of cybersecurity. So I presented at ARC before and I have one slide that has a, a diagram of a scale. It's like we want to enable the business transformation, but we need to balance that out with the right cybersecurity capabilities. We don't want to go too cyber secure where we erode the value of the business opportunity. So that balance of what's the fit for purpose, fit for risk approach is something that we're continuously evaluating and we utilize our governance capabilities to make sure that we're having the informed decisions. Thank you. Go ahead. So in 1958, the Chinese government instituted the uh, four pests campaign, or four pests for hygiene campaign. Some of you may or may not have heard of that, um, but the general premise, premise was that there were four 
different um, causes of certain types of uh, issues within the, uh, the Chinese uh, state. Three of those were targeting uh, malaria, typhoid, and the plague. But the fourth is the one you hear most about, and that was the sparrow. That sparrow was responsible for eating some of the crops. So they thought by eliminating these pests, they, they could um, reduce the impact to their, their people by uh, eliminating the root cause of the, the pests, pestilence that they had. So if you Google the four pest campaign, you don't readily find the number of people that were saved by the reduction in malaria, typhoid, or the plague. What you find is the impact that the sparrow had in causing or contributing to the great Chinese famine. So I guess in, in our approach in BASF is to look at or make sure we have the uh, enough information so that our management can make an informed decision and the unintended consequences of those decisions are minimized. So as we go through the process, and, and Ricky said it best, I, I, I couldn't, couldn't have said it better, of trying to enable these digital transformation efforts, you know, the business needs, what are the unintended consequences? Do we have enough information to understand what those unintended consequences are? Because if you Google the, the four pests campaign, a lot of times it comes back to the Great Famine um, where millions of people died. We don't know how many people were saved by the other three actors that were eliminated, but we do see a big emphasis on those that were negatively impacted. And so you may, may have something that's you know, good in your environment, a new idea, a new concept, new whatever it is, but do you have enough information to make an informed decision about how the unintended consequences will be received or viewed or a result? So that's, that's kind of the same idea as the governance that Ricky was mentioning? I'm just saying, Ricky's point about- you, you The balance, the yeah. balance between meeting the business needs and understanding what those con the consequences of, of meeting those needs will result in from a you know, reputation, you know, life and-, and, and other results. And, and um, go ahead. Say, just one more point on that governance. I, I do think it's the, the way that we frame it at ExxonMobil is we have our, our, our IT organization, our engineering organization, and our operations functions as part of that governance. And the operations functions are also the voice of our facilities. So whether it's a refining chem plant, upstream facility, loop plant, et cetera. So there's a significant amount of opportunity that we could execute on. But the engineering disciplines and the cyber focus come together with those business groups to, to really understand how do we enable this with the right lens of cybersecurity? Because the one thing about we, the opportunity that we have in front of us today is there's so many things that we can go do um, that could potentially enable value for the facilities, but we need to make sure that we're doing it with the right lens of business enablement and cybersecurity. Uh, I want to open up the floor for questions, but before I do that, I, let me just ask one question because uh, I didn't do this, but another group at ARC, or one of my colleagues in the digitalization uh, team, or digital transformation team, again, I don't know how we call it today, but they, they did a survey of, I think it was 700, 600, 700 companies they got to participate. Uh, but anyhow, it was just a simple question, kind of assessing where are you in your digital transformation journey, all right? So, and you know, the one thing I saw in the survey, unfortunately, it didn't map real well to cybersecurity. I mean, but it's, sort of, it's what kind of things are people doing? So, and it, it really showed that it was quite active. There was, it seemed to be stalling in some ways. So the article that we just, he just wrote recently, a report about, you know, what you can do to kind of just get it going again. But anyhow, what I was gonna ask the people here, when you look at that screen, you know, those little things I talked about, how many of those things are your company actually looking at? I mean, Ricky made the comment that they all resonate, and I'm sure they do, but I, I think most companies are actually looking at all of those things already. Yeah. It's not something, it's not just 
I mean, there's a lot of sales hype, uh, you, analyst hype. Excuse me, I don't want to criticize the salesman, but you know about oh, you need to jump and do this, you need to jump and do that, and I tend to be jaded about that kind of stuff. But but in reality, there, I think there is an awful lot that's actually happening out there, and that was why I made my comment at the end of saying tomorrow's here. I mean, it's not like this is something that's going to happen. It's happening, and I know it varies by companies. I know some will say, well, you're never going to do that in my plant or this type of stuff, which is valid. But I think a lot is happening. And so I just wonder, you guys agree with that? I mean, your companies are doing most of those things? Yeah, I would say the only one that seems to be, in my mind, missing is the advances in data science. So that's buried in a few of these, but I think it deserves its own bubble, but all of this plus, right? So. Same with you, Glenn? I would say there's a lot of buzzword bingo up there. Yeah, 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 I know. And that's why That's why I wanted to ask that question. And so... Oh, you're saying they're ill-defined? Is that what you mean? Or? Well, I mean, I think that a lot of the stuff that we're renaming has been going on for, you know, 20, 30 years. Yeah. Yep. Um, you know, it, it's just marketing, you know, way to get... And, and, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It, it's just the fact that a lot of this stuff has been going on and will continue to go on, and we'll just find new names to associate with it. But it's enabling businesses to be more profitable and in whatever form that is. And, and you know, the latest trend is the term, you know, digitalization. And, uh, you know, as vague as that is, it, it's uh, what we're hearing in the marketplace. And that's what, uh, you know, people at, up at the top saying, are we doing these things? And they think, you know, talking about standing up in entire, you know, business units or entire service organizations to try to meet that demand and try to figure out how it fits within your organization. You know, same holds true within BSF. We, we do have a growth of some, you know, service organizations to try to, to capture and meet those demands, wherever it fits on that scale. Yeah, I, I, I had the same view often because of my background. That a lot of the stuff like with predictive maintenance, it's a, you know, that can get twisted and come up with a new term, and but it's been around forever. Right. But the one thing I think that I've kind of accepted at least is there's a m lot more connectivity involved in it, a lot more data that's being done. It's being done in a different way. I mean, using more things that do impact upon cybersecurity. That's why I kind of bring it up. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Glenn. I think a lot of this has been ongoing for, for years. What we're seeing is some of these activities are thinking that they need direct connectivity into the control system and that's where we need to step in and say, do you really need connectivity into the control system? Or are you just looking for data that we can find an opportunity to push out of the control system? So we're not creating a threat vector into a very critical environment. So how do we come together between our operations, engineering, IT, and cyber functions to evaluate opportunities to get data out so you can enable a lot of those circles, but you're not coming into a very critical control system which can have some unintended consequences, as Glenn was alluding to earlier. Yeah, trying to get it plugged in early enough, early enough in the innovative process, because you, you, you want your teams to be flexible, you want to be able to have innovative things come to the table, but how do you get all the right people involved at the, at, at early enough in the process so that you're not the ones at the end saying, no, we can't do this because. You know, you're, you're wanting to say, okay, well, let's help you find a way to do what you want to do, as opposed to being the, the one saying no. Yeah, and rather than treating cybersecurity as the gatekeepers, treat them as the service providers. And, and that's, that's a shift. I mean, that's something that has fairly recently kind of ha taken off, particularly with a lot of companies moving from, I'm, I'm not sure how projects are managed you know, across the board, but there's the very waterfall sort of approach. And now companies are transitioning to agile or whatever flavor of agile you want to talk about. And in a lot of cases, that's, a, that's premised on teamwork, collaboration, those kinds of things. That's the inroad that we've been using to get our OT cybersecurity engineering groups that is a relatively new creation into those those design, development, implementation teams so that it's part of the foundation. Yeah, and, and, and I, I, the term that comes to mind when, when I think about cybersecurity is more a sustainable support partner because mm -hmm. you could do this stuff now um, without them, 
but then when it comes to, all right, now you're gonna have to implement so many security controls on top of what yep. you've developed that it makes it useless. So if you want that solution to be sustainable, you know, bring them in early on to. And am among the many consistent things about the operations side of the house is they, they do not consider cybersecurity part of their day job. They, they right. don't want to be responsible for that. However, if part of your original architecture that was supposed to secure you federated them, right. they were almost always responsible for maintaining all of these IT you know, things that were being pushed out to those environments, and that just isn't a sustainable model. Yeah, I, I would add, though, you know, we, in, within our manufacturing, refining chemicals business lines, we have been in partnership with our operations organization trying to drive cybersecurity behavior into the culture of the facilities. Mm -hmm. And so getting it integrated into your console operators work processes. So mm -hmm. if they see something suspicious or anomalous, they know what to do. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a, a cyber activity, but it's trying to ingrain that within the operational staff at the facilities. So they, they know the right reactions to take and they're empowered to take right. those actions when needed. I think we have a question. Oh, is there a question over <laughs> a there? A few questions. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's what we want here. I have a bunch too, but I'll... Oh, please, you all do it. Go ahead. Uh, good. Oh, yes, it's on. Good. Good morning. My, my name is Michelle Balderson. I am from Atorio. I will state that I'm from a vendor, uh, not from an end user customer. And uh, one of the things I'd like to state is uh, your conversation is extremely refreshing. Uh, what I see, and, and no disrespect to ARC or SID, uh, it's every industry analyst that we hear about. Is we hear from visibility to control to situational awareness to actionable intelligence to timely and appropriate response to risk. But what we don't hear is the enterprise approach to cybersecurity across the entire enterprise and the way that you're building. You're building it from what I hear is, is taking it to the executive group and really aligning it to a cybersecurity management system framework, just like 62443 defines. Um, so, so my question, it really is, um, for the audience, is, is, is that I see that the industry really talks about immaturity of OT and then talks about maturity of IT, where really what we're talking about is enterprise cybersecurity across the entire enterprise, not, not IT or OT, but uh, cross-functional and cross-domain expertise. So how do you, your, your corporations are extremely large. How do you, do you get to the point where you have that programmatical approach to cybersecurity? We, I, I've been in the industry for cybersecurity for 25 years of my life. I haven't seen very many corporations do that programmatical approach. And are you using systems similar to the way that IEC 62443 defines of building a cybersecurity management system that allows to align all of those cross-domain expertise people, processes, and the technology together. Yep. Who wants to take that? I, I'll, I mean, I mean go ahead. All right. Uh, so just maybe one nuance. Uh, I, I wouldn't consider OT cybersecurity immature. I, I, I think it's fit for purpose, and it's continuing to evolve as the threat vectors continue to evolve. So by design, there is some parts of our operations technology environments that may not have the same tools and capabilities as an enterprise IT environment, but we're evolving those capabilities as the threat vectors evolve. And I, and I think that's a, a fair approach. You don't want to overinvest in that. You want to evolve as the demand and the environment continues to evolve. So, so just wanted to add that nuance. From a systems perspective, at ExxonMobil, we have a, a a policy, a standard in place that takes the NIST cybersecurity framework and elements of 62443 and combines them in alignment with our overall corporate policy for security and controls. And that's how we implement the standards and practices for industrial cybersecurity. And we, we maintain that standard through partnership with our operations businesses across the corporation, our engineering disciplines, and IT. And so we're continuing to look at that and make sure that we're enabling the right standards and practices for facilities to implement and steward to ensure that they have the fit for purpose approach for cybersecurity. Because at ExxonMobil, we, we have the full scale of different industrial facilities. We have very complex, higher risk facilities like refineries and chemical plants. 
And then we have fuels terminals. We have lube operating facilities. We have different upstream type facilities as well. And then we have some government regulated critical infrastructure like pipeline facilities in the United States. So we need a system that's scalable and fit for purpose across all those industrial facilities so we can implement the appropriate measures for each industrial type facility that we have in the corporation. Yeah, you, you hear a lot about breaking down silos and then that sounds great, that's, that's sort of fortune cookie wisdom, but then, then what, right? Like how, how do I make that happen? Um, one of the approaches that Chevron has taken is, you know, traditionally you have the sort of engineering side of the house and the IT side of the house and most OT cybersecurity would have traditionally fallen onto that engineering side and you have an inherent silo at that point. You're, you're thinking very much in different terms and, and often there can be friction between those organizations. So why not, and, and part of digital transformation, this is what we did, was we created what's called the Chevron Technology Center now. It's not an IT organization purely, it's not an engineering organization, it's a service organization that provides those sorts of services, capabilities, et cetera, enterprise-wide. And now we have the OT security folks and the same teams with the IT security folks. You've, you've literally fused the silos together. And at that point, the, the collaboration opportunities are ridiculous. And there is so much that both groups can learn from the other. Um, I tend to say this a lot, it, it, every, every, so every capability or solution that has been generated to defend in the IT space has some application in the OT space if you look hard enough. There's tons of opportunities there. And that was not always a really open highway between them. And now that we've created, you know, like I said, the center that is thinking of it as more of a service organization, that's really changed the game. Okay. Yeah, so just to build on that. I, I believe that there will always be healthy tension between an engineering organization or in, maybe an engineering discipline and an IT discipline. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's very, very relevant because IT folks can bring a lot of skills and competency to the table, but they will never have the domain expertise from an engineering discipline perspective. And so sometimes that facilitates some very difficult conversations if you bring all those same people in the same organization, does that help? Maybe so, maybe not. Uh, maybe Chevron's experiencing some, some really good learnings from that. But there needs to be some tension points there because there's a, just like there's a whole lot of digital opportunities on that slide, there's a whole lot of things that we can do from a cybersecurity perspective within an OT environment. That doesn't mean we should do them. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be fit for purpose and fit for risk. So having some of that tension between your engineering discipline and your IT or cyber discipline can be very healthy to make sure that you're appropriately deploying capabilities that are gonna provide some cyber value and not have a residual implication to operations like Glenn was alluding to earlier. Yeah, so, so from my perspective, I think what I, I, I heard you asking is, is really about the policy framework. Um, in historically, you know, but when we created our uh, policy governing our, our OT cybersecurity, it was aligned directly with IEC 62443 back in 2012 or whatever. Um, it was an engineering policy. <clears throat> we have um, taken steps over the past, uh, what, five years, three, four, four or five years, to now move all of that policy, the ownership of those policies, into a corporate center. So that, that incorporates IT and OT policies, all, all policies across the board. So although there is still alignment or attempted attempts at alignment to, you know, IEC 62443 in the specific documents associated with, associated with the OT cybersecurity, it's all under one uh, policy framework. And it's just one subset of the policy framework uh, that our corporate center, you know, administers. So that's an attempt to try to bring that stuff together under one organization as opposed to, you know, the, the, the tension between the two organ the, the various organizations when it comes to the actual policy framework. Let me, let me, uh, we we'll, we'll, we'll want as many questions on the floor as we can, but I, I have a short memory, so I have to ask mine. But, you know, everything you were saying there about the way you're, you're working together now with engineering and operations and everything to try to make security a service or maybe an enabler or you know, whatever term you might use. But one thing I've seen or I, I suspect, and I'm not on the front line like you guys, 
But a lot of things are, it's like agile design. You mentioned the word agile. It's the difference between old time design of software, which I come from, where you were very strict and you figured you had to get everybody to say, I need to know exactly what you want, and then you tell me, and then you design some specs, and you write it, and you test it, and then you put it out. And I think in the end, that solved those problems well. The only problem is all of a sudden something changed, <laughs> right? And so it was slow that way. And now it's, the world's kind of shifted more to just throw something together, give it a try, and if it doesn't work, we'll change it kind of stuff. But very agile, very fast. And the two seem to me to be in conflict. If you say, for example, you have a governance policy that says we have to all meet and agree on what we're going to do here, or like your comment, Ricky, about saying some stuff should just be pushed out, which I agree with, but the next question that I think you would ask is, okay, please tell me what information you need. And what you find out is they don't know what information they're going to need because they, the, the new thing is going to be come out tomorrow and they're going to need something else. So how do you deal with that that tension between agility, I'll use the word agility here, and, and design, engineered designs. I've said that like with interfaces for systems, I've written some stuff where I made the comment, no, I don't, I don't no doubt that everybody has secure connections to other things, everybody's connected to IT systems, OT systems for years. And they're well engineered and all the kind of transfers are well defined and you can protect that. But how do you deal with Whenever somebody says, well, I need this additional new information, or I need this, it's new, it's something different, it becomes very rigid if that's the way you have to do it. So, you know, you, go to the, you have to go to security people, they have to approve it, they have to design something, it's just too slow. I'm just wondering how are you dealing with that, or maybe you don't have that problem, maybe it's just in Sid Snitkin's mind that the world is like that. So if, if you're reevaluating your governance policy per iteration of solution development, you're probably not doing governance, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, step one is define that clearly up front, right? Have the, the folks that are responsible for assuring that during solution development, design, change, et cetera, involved in those teams from the get-go so that that's represented, like I said, foundationally as part of your capability to do that. Um, in, in the old days, we really did have that problem because at, as I said, the traditional sort of waterfall execution of things, cybersecurity was a gate. You know, you got to a certain point and then said, hey, cyber, check it out. What do you think? Oh, nope, we have to recycle. Now you can be a lot more, well, sorry, I don't mean to reuse, keep reusing agile, but it's an iterative design that's built in, right? You can quickly change course, you can quickly adapt. That's really what it's about. But if you don't have A, your governance and policy stuff decided ahead of time as best you can, and the folks that can represent that wealth of knowledge in those teams, then yeah, you're gonna have a tough time. <clears throat> I was in a meeting one time with a, a former director and he said that Agile is an excuse to be sloppy. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, I, 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 I might agree with that, you know, sometimes. With um, but so, it's there. <laughs> yeah, so, but, but what I would say is, uh, you know, the majority of our businesses, what we do, what, what the people that are running the facilities, they're, they're managing risk, and they're very, very good at managing risk. So from a cyber perspective, cyber is just another element of risk management that the sites need to understand. And we have a role to help inform the right decision makers to help them manage, accept, or mitigate, decide to mitigate that risk. Mm -hmm. And again, there are so many opportunities that the, our sites are faced with every day. People are trying to sell capabilities to the sites. You have IT maybe selling capabilities to the sites. All these internal organizations trying to enable the sites. We just want to make sure that we have that right interface to help inform the decision makers so that they can manage that risk and make decisions on are they going to accept risk or invest in various mitigations. So, yeah, very well said. I mean, I, the one thing I wrote down when you were saying that is, um, I think, it's, you know, the, the Hippocratic Oath. You know, first do no harm. You know, in in our in our policy framework, it it should allow for enough flexibility and have the guidelines um, of your architectural design. Um, not so rigid that you can't be productive, but rigid enough that regardless, as long as you're adhering to that, then certain amounts of risk are going to be mitigated. So 
we are in the process of reevaluating our architectural you know, design. Not to say that the existing framework is irrelevant, but there are a lot more demands and not more needs, or a lot more perceived connectivity needs. You know, and, and we, we may or may not need additional connectivity. We may, or, we may just need different understanding of where things fit in that architectural design. We just need data. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, and and that, that's a, the prime thing. We always ask, do you need connectivity or do you need data? And most of the time, it's, it's just data. And how they get that data is, if, it can, if we can enable that data communication without ad additional risk to the plants, and then on top of that, being able to communicate in a clear way to the risk owner what those risks are, it, it's, it's challenging for a security professional that that may visualize you know, 50 slides to, to expand on the nuance of a specific risk that, that may be introduced by something. And then as you summarize that to one bullet on one slide that gets to the, the uh, board level, it, you really lose a lot of that nuance. And so it ends up being a binary decision, yes or no. Um, and sometimes it's not always binary. And, and I really like what Glenn said about the architecture. So the architecture, from an ICS perspective, that, that should be the standard from which you enable various capabilities. Now, in, in ExxonMobil, it's our engineering organization that really owns the design specifications for an ICS architecture, how that integrates with the control system, how that integrates with the enterprise and, and all that. So. Again, going back to the governance bullet, having the right people come together from a subject matter expert perspective to con, you know, continuously or periodically test, should there be an evolution of the architecture to enable some of the operational capabilities that the business is coming forward with, and how do we collaboratively do that together? Or do you not need to evolve the architecture? You just have to figure out how do we get data to these people that right. are now asking for it? Right. Because we do not need to give them persistent access to a control system environment. Yeah, and how do you ensure that you've done your due diligence? You know, because the the requester often comes says, well, the vendor says this is safe and it's not going to you know have a problem. But how do you have the right processes in place to evaluate whether that is or is not a true statement? Um, and that's one of the challenges we face because you know often we'll get, you know, from the electrical side they'll they'll say well this is a system you know that we have that that you know they can't do anything to it it's connected to read only access to a, a UPS and we want to give vendor access to this, but then when you dig down into it and you realize that there are ways that 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 could be changed communication that that could be enabled that that could cause some problems, well. Well, now you're too far down the road to, to, to shut the door on it. So, yeah, And how often is the explanation that we can't do something when, in fact, it won't? Right. Because, you know, th there's a lot of solutions like that where, oh, it's, it's read-only by right. configuration. Exactly. <laughs> but I can change the configuration, and then it's not, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's not can't, it's won't. <laughs> it, it's the capability, not the intended use yeah. that, that we have to worry about. And, and do we have the right people evaluating the the, the proposed solution right. to get to that intended that you know capability analysis as opposed to the intended use yeah and so I'll do my little plug for secure by design so you know there's lots of things you can say about secure by design but, but one of them is the difference between I I solemnly swear I will not misconfigure this <laughs> safeguard versus it's just designed to be secure you right. can't yeah. mess it up yeah. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you have data diodes in place everywhere instead of firewalls. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yep. There were no hands, were there? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a question hand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. you can ask a question. That's fine. Please. I'll just keep asking. I've got to watch this. Watch Hi. myself. Hi, all. Uh, great conversation. Um, I'm curious, you know, the you know, two things are always going to be changing, right? The threat and then also just kind of capabilities. I mean, you see the slide, right? So there's always sort of new situations coming up. And, you know, with large firms like yours, do you have sort of machinery, a work process with a systematic approach to assess the threat, you know, 
failure mode analysis, and, and I'm kind of hearkening back to the comment, Glenn, you made about sort of, you know, the investment level, right? Because, you know, you're trying to prove the negative hypothesis, which says, you know, what's the cost of not doing it, right? So, so I'm kind of curious what sort of machinery you guys have in place to sort of, you know, kind of go through that threat assessment and, you know, kind of have a, a you know, recommend a, an investment level. And by machinery, you mean the, the process, not, work, work not process, physical machinery. Pe people process tools, you yeah. know, methodologies, tools, certain yeah. capabilities. Thanks. One of my favorite statements um, that Rob Lee makes is, be exceptional at the basics. And, and I know that there's a, a, a big push in a lot of areas to um, change architectural designs but you, you really need to, or at least you know, my perspective, and, and I try to, to encourage my colleagues to, to follow the same way, is, is create a defensible architecture and then evaluate whether the new whatever it is is going to put that defensible architecture at risk. And in most cases, you can find a solution that does not compromise the, the you know, increase the risk to your OT, OT environment. Um, th that doesn't, I mean, there's a, a topic that I, I've coined in, internally um, that my, my manager gets mad every time I say it, but dependency management, it's a little bit different than uh, business continuity planning, but I think in the first session they, they kind of hit on it about you know, what dependencies do you have Yes, we may still be able to create chemicals uh, if the IT system's completely shut down, but can we ship the sim can we print the uh, bill of lading? Can we can we ship that product? You know, is the logistic system down? So, so there are dependencies there and and, and a uh, a requirement for collaboration between you know the IT and OT side, and then finding a balance you know to that. So, so I'm I'm. Certainly not happy about the increasing volume of adversary action. However, if there is a little tiny silver lining in that, it's that we gain more intelligence and understanding of how they behave because of that, right? So that, that being said, you know, there's a lot of dimensions of risk management, cybersecurity, and those sorts of things. Threat intelligence is obviously one of those. Um, there are opportunities now, however, to start we have something we didn't have 10 years ago. We have the ability to characterize threats, their behaviors, their TTPs, those sorts of things. Um, if I can then look at, I mean, this is kind of classic uh, MITRE attack and defend framework stuff, right? But if, if I can take the, the defenses, the capabilities that I'm trying to develop and I want to create a value proposition, if I can take how pretty accurate information about how adversaries are acting and what they're doing, I can marry the two and say, well, clearly my dollar here is worth more than my dollar here. Um, that is something that is, I would say, relatively new as a capability that, that we're leveraging. Yeah. And for us, it goes back to that governance discussion where you have operations, engineering, and IT coming together to evaluate what are the highest risk areas that we want to approach and make sure that we have the right level of investment to approach that. But we have a roadmap that does change and evolve as we adapt to changing threats or business priorities. If some of those circles up there were gaining more momentum, maybe that could influence our roadmap a little bit more. But for us, it's really bringing together operations, engineering, and IT to make sure that we're working on the right things at the right time. Nothing, nothing for there. Yeah, go ahead, Keith. Is this thing on? Yeah, keep it turned off. Can, yeah. can, I, uh, can, can I take liberties instead of X and both of my questions at the same time? No. Well, I don't know what the questions question. are. I have I'll to, buy a vowel. No, I need to review the questions, right? We have a committee. All right. <laughs> Bring it to the governor. Okay, Keith. The governor's Keith, committee. Keith Deshari, I'm with uh, Dollar General uh, <laughs> Chemicals and Petrochemicals. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of hit on two questions that are a little bit more real, I think, than, than strategy-wise that y'all been talking about. And my first question is, at Dollar General, uh, we have a general dollar dealers division that has been doing a lot of digitalization uh, as we see up here on the board. And to be quite honest, you know, in, in our discussions with even other companies outside of Dollar General, uh, we've seen these 
these technologies get rolled out with little to no value uh, and a whole lot of risk, a whole lot of holes punched in. And so I'm wondering if y'all taking any proactive approach to address how we do technologies in the company, in your companies, and uh, how to get people to kind of take a step back from rolling those things out. And then my second question is also in reference to Rob Lee from Dragos. Uh, well, I've heard several times in several talks make the comment, we need to get the IT approach out of the OT environment. And I'm wondering what y'all doing in that perspective as well. Can you all remember both those questions? Go ahead. <laughs> I, I think I'm so. sure you will. <laughs> I've read the Dollar General corporate statement, so I can remember. <laughs> yeah. get, get your IT chocolate out of my OT peanut butter. Right? Um, so on the first part of that question, they, I mean, I, I think at the end of the day, there's, well, I'm kind of blanking on the first part of your question. Re can you rebuttal Yeah, because I let, forgot let, it too. Can you rephrase re your me, first question? Let me elaborate on the first part of his question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah, I, I actually formulated an answer, and that's why I forgot the question. So, back to uh, some statements that were made earlier about defining architectures. So, one of the ways that you can approach that is to define accepted architectures, publish those internally, and then justify deviation. And if, you've, if you find an architecture, a solution that you know, is digitalization, you've defined a clear acceptable architecture, you've, de you've documented that internally and said that's our standard, and it comes back to governance, I guess, then you as an organization have essentially said that's, that's what success looks like if you want to do that. If you went down that road, found that it wasn't, there was no value return, it wasn't an acceptable architecture, it wasn't an acceptable solution, it doesn't get documented effectively, and it doesn't become part of your governance standard. So I'm sure there's more to add to that. Yeah, so in response to the first question, I, I look at it from two different lenses. So number one, you can look at these type of technology enablers from a business perspective, and how do you gauge success of deploying a capability like Digital Twin? We would leverage our operations function to tell us what that success looks like, and they would be accountable for measuring that value. From a cybersecurity perspective, though, we are getting inundated as an industry with tools and widgets to deploy that supposedly help us enable more cyber capabilities. No offense to any of the suppliers, there's a lot of good intention, but it's, it's up to us as owners and operators to determine what is fit for purpose for our approach. Because, I mean, we can spend all the business's budget in deploying capabilities that add very, very, very little value. And, and frankly, at ExxonMobil, we, we have some good examples of technology that we've deployed that, have, that are very questionable from a cyber value perspective. So when you look at the total cost of ownership of something, you know, on, on a one pager, it can look very attractive to deploy that capability. But then you look at how do you sustain that? Do you have the right competency and skills within your organization to do the analysis of all the data that that widget is going to generate? And then even if you do have the right competency, how do you take meaningful action mm -hmm. so that you can, not to use this term in this context, but close the loop when you see something that requires action? How do you actually take the appropriate response to it? So we as an industry really need to continue to evaluate what capabilities are fit for purpose for our specific companies and then measure the value and the cost of sustainment for those types of capabilities. Because we can go into the supplier hall later this afternoon and there's a ton of things that we could invest in. And just like up on this slide, there's a ton of things that the business can invest in. But just because we can doesn't mean that we should. Yeah, um, I'm going to avoid the <laughs> the uh, part of that question that I know that he's intending, um, and and we'll stick to the security related uh, investments. Um, but 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 you're right. Um, I at least in our organization, uh, I think it's important to. We don't always have a good way of identifying successes and failures when the um, 
the result's intent is to not see anything. Um, what do I mean by that? So if you're saying that we want to prevent X from happening and you've never seen X happen before and you implement this tool that ensures you that you're not going to see X happening again, how do you know that you implemented something that's of value? And that's a really, really tough question. Um, my, my approach, um, and, I, and I think it's gaining some ground internally, is to, to look at specific threat actors. So trust that your IT organization is doing their job in that partnership, and then focus on the OT security side on the things that are specific to the OT environment. What are the threat actors that are specifically targeting your sector, and what are their TTPs, and how do you defend against them? And so instead of just saying, we need to see everything that we're doing. We need to, to, to deploy all this stuff because we might eventually catch something somewhere. Look at what, where your, your gaps are in your environment. What are the threat actors that are specifically targeting your industry? Um, and what are they, they doing? Now, I can say that from, from a BASF perspective because we have a fairly rigid model. Not, we, we don't have a lot of environments where we have remote operations uh, the need for remote operation. We have manned facilities in our plants. And so we don't have the same um, attack vector as some of the, the guys probably in this room, some of the, you know, yeah. you know the Exxon, some of these guys where you've got unmanned facilities and you've got to enable additional communications and capabilities where maybe you need some additional visibility there. But in a lot of the environments, you know, it, it's good enough, to, I like your fit for purpose, um, you know, uh, term, it, it fits, the defensive mechanisms we have in place fit the threat actor capabilities and, and the, the stuff that we're aware of. Yeah, I, so I have a, this number is purely my own invention. I don't have any scientific backup for it, but I would argue that about 25, 30% of your investment in cybersecurity solutions should be directed at validation. Much like you said, we oftentimes will measure success of a cybersecurity solution by its successful implementation. And it's like, well, the back of the box says it will def defend me against X, so it must be good. No way to prove that whatsoever. And so there are capabilities growing all the time that you can use, you know, be they automated, uh, pen testing, modeling and simulation. There, there are lots of ways that you can validate something. I think the analogy that I used when I was talking to my boss the other day about this was Mercedes doesn't build a Formula One car and then go, we built it, it's going to win. I mean, there's a lot of testing that goes into that, right? You have to be able to back up your designs and prove that what you spent the money and time on actually has some kind of return. Um, until I think we start embracing, and again, that 25, 30% is just a purely made up number. I, I have no scientific reason for it, but it sounds about right. It passes the gut check. So w one more thing. Um, we often rely on the 80-20 rule. You know, you're going to cover 80%. To go back to my example at the beginning, 75% of that Chinese initiative, pest initiative, was successful. But you really hear about the 25% that wasn't. Um, so that 80-20 rule may not always apply when it comes to security. It may be that 1% that, that's the, the challenge. But where do you find that 1%? You, you, you can't bankrupt the company spending on cybersecurity. Yeah. But the same, same token, you can't be blind to the fact that that's some, some risks exist. Yeah, I agree. And I go back to that, that if you can imagine in your head a, a, a slide with a balance on it, right? There is a very good balance that needs to be appropriated there. Um, a lot of the capabilities that we've deployed, you know, luckily we haven't identified any significant cybersecurity concerns. We've identified some operational opportunities to go back into our facilities and say, hey, you know, your OPC uh, configuration is, is not really appropriate, so you should change that. And they may or may not, you know, do it right now because if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Um, but we're we're trying to use our investment in cybersecurity to also loop back into some operational opportunities mm -hmm. as well. 
So the more visibility that you get into an ICS mm -hmm. environment, you're going to find some things that are just, I like to call them operational optimizations. Um, mm -hmm. Sites may not do anything right. with it at the time because it may not be the highest priority, but still, it's another indicator of gaining visibility with whatever widget capability you want to deploy um, does have some residual benefits. They may not be significant, but it's another demonstration right. of some of the value. Yeah, another question. Another question? Another question. Uh, this is Martin Duck Michelle. Um, so you talk about fit for purpose and, and, and risk and so forth. Uh, and how do you know you spent the right amount of money? You know, so question is, do you have an OT specific risk assessment methodology that you can apply to, no, to understand what the risk actually is, cybersecurity risk is at a particular asset. And then a follow-up question would be, how do you know that, that maybe the controls that you would apply to mitigate the risk that's been discovered, you know, is taking you to what the business would con be considered, uh, you know, meeting the risk appetite? Yeah. How, do you, how do you know when you've reached that point? Well, I think reaching that point is an evolving uh, discussion. Um, but from a risk perspective, um, I think at ExxonMobil we have a very mature risk assessment approach. And so, it, and that's really, because again, what we're really good at within this room is managing and understanding risk. We do it all the time. So from a cybersecurity perspective, it's just taking another lens at that. So we have a mature risk assessment approach and from that assessment spits out mitigations that a facility would need to own. And it's gonna vary across our business lines. So within our unconventional upstream business, you know, out in West Texas, that risk looks a lot different than a refinery that's in the middle of a highly populated community. And it looks different than an offshore platform in the middle of the ocean. And it looks different than a fuels terminal that we have to operate as well. So again, we look at the risk, we have the right people involved in the assessment of the risk. We have the right people involved to determine what mitigating controls need to be put in place to mitigate risk and then the right level of leadership is endorsing any acceptance of residual risk that's left over. Yeah. John, oh. So, so our risk assessment process, it's not a static one and done. So every risk owner is required to reassess risk at an interval appropriate with the level of risk of that environment. So if it's a critical risk environment, they're gonna have to reassess that risk at a higher frequency. It could be annual or biannual. And so if it's a critical risk environment, they're looking at that risk assessment at a higher frequency and reevaluating the mitigating controls they have in place. And then as probably most of us in the room have, we have an independent audit organization that comes in and assesses mitigating controls associated with that risk. And then even from an operations perspective, we have something at ExxonMobil called Operations Integrity Maintenance System, or OIMS. They have other independent assessments that come in and look at operations integrity risk. So at Exxon, we have an independent controllers organization from an audit standpoint, and then we have internal assessments from an operations integrity perspective. And I presume you've got hooks into your management of change processes and things like that that kick off evaluation, risk assessment. Evaluation. Yeah, so if something yeah. changes within right. the environment that could change the risk factor mm -hmm. or one of those mitigating controls, then the risk owner would be responsible for reassessing the risk. Or if you introduce new technology or something like that as well. Yeah, and I, I know this is a fine point of terminology, but oftentimes when we're talking about controls, particularly with our government's organization. I mean, we are kind of talking cyber hygiene, compliance oriented sort of things, right? And so we try to be very clear that if we're developing mitigations to deal with risk that's been measured and identified, I mean, sometimes there, the implication is that the controls weren't enough and that you actually need something in addition to that, right? To properly drive that risk down. Oftentimes that gets documented as uh, enhanced standards and enhanced, maybe controls and also uh, like architectural documentations, engineering standards, da 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 da, da um, that we, we want to find opportunities where if we find that risk and we find an appropriate mitigation that involves engineering or architecture or whatever, that we can share that across the entire enterprise and, and you know, mitigate a lot more risk 
broadly than just that one isolated in, in, in facility. And, and just one more thing, just everybody be cautious about creating an over-controlled situation. Mm -hmm. Because again, this industry is phenomenal at managing risk and accepting risk. But we also can sometimes, when it comes to cybersecurity, we can get focused on deploying too many widgets, deploying too many capabilities. Now that increases cost and complexity, and it may not be reducing actual risk. It may make you feel better, but it may not actually be reducing risk. So just be cautious, incorporate that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that, I mean, that's a very difficult. Uh, when you come up with the magic formula, please let us yeah, know. Yeah, I was about to say, that's a very <laughs> difficult question to answer. Did you, do you think, I mean, it may actually increase risk sometimes, right? I, if I, you put in too many things you don't have time to take care of, you aren't taking care of the things you should be taking care of. There have definitely yeah. been cybersecurity vulnerabilities introduced by cybersecurity safeguards. Yeah. 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 Well, and then also, I mean, it can, it can create a false sense of assurance, right? I, I deployed this shiny object and now I'm secure. Well, and that, that and, doesn't and really then you start doing bad things. Yeah, but actually what you did was you deployed a shiny object that required you to open up another port on your firewall, and so you create a new threat vector yep. to your ICS environment. Yep. And, and that capability actually needs to talk out to a cloud-hosted <laughs> system so it can pull down definition updates. So you have to be careful. My favorite the shiny object syndrome can, can catch up. My favorite nit to pick is encrypt everything, right? Well, no, no. because you have, <laughs> that is you, have not correct. you have next gen firewalls <laughs> that can do deep packet inspection for a reason, right? <laughs> uh, there's, there's another question in the back, then I'll get to you, John. I'm Perfect, sorry. thank you very much. It's Michelle Balderson from Atorio again. And I have to say that this, uh, this panel has been exceptional. I, I really like the conversation. And one of the things that you guys focused on and you talked about it for a little bit was access to the data versus access to the process. And uh, with that is, is that what I see is that it shifts the risk from a physical risk over to a data or a cyber risk. Yep. And uh, where we're in the market space today is sort of with that thinking is that we'll start to see propagation of data lakes across our enterprises. And um, I'm gonna ask the entire audience, how many of you believe that you have a strong classification of data to your risk management program today? And I'll, and, and I'll ask the, the everybody else every, on the panel as well. As I believe that we need to have a stronger classification of data to be able to be able to have unified data lakes. Or it comes down to how are they gaining access to the data lake versus how are they gaining access to the process, right? So I'll, that, that's my question. It really is, is, is that how are you protecting that data and how are you classifying that data? So I, I think that's a great question. So to me, where you have the digital twin circle up there, it, it becomes really, really important. So we don't want to have excessive access into the industrial control system because we want to preserve the integrity of that environment. But we want to get data out so we can enable things like a digital twin type capability, which is highly dependent upon process data within the ICS. But then that starts to create a different security question around the classification of that data. Is that data considered proprietary data? And if so, what are the appropriate mitigating controls that you need to wrap around that? So it's not really, it's not an ICS cyber type question. It's more of a, a data integrity and classification question. So that's something that we're very interested in. One of our colleagues is gonna speak on that later this week. So I would encourage you to attend that session on Digital Twin that ExxonMobil is going to lead. But that, that's a question that we need to wrap our heads around. It, what is the classification of process data once it leaves the ICS environment? Mm -hmm. And how do we preserve the integrity with, the, again, a fit for purpose approach to make sure it's appropriately controlled? And in fact, I'll take it one step further. What if you think of that data from a classification perspective as not particularly sensitive but it is a dependency for an optimization, which is sensitive, right? So exactly, yeah, yeah. even through its life cycle, it can, it can change classification. Yeah, if you're making operational decisions based upon right. the data, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so one of the challenges that, that, uh, that we see is much of the data, you know, the ones and zeros that come out of the process are pretty much useless to an adversary unless you have the PNIDs and all the other you know, aspects to create a, a mock, you know, a simulation of, of the process outside of, of that environment. And so the, 
the, even though the classification of the, you know, the current value of, of, of a pump may be, you know, internal, labeled as internal, the other components uh, of that, as far as PNIDs, the, the, the engineering diagrams, those may have a strictly confidential, you know, labeling. Um, we, we do have processes in place with certain, you know, tools to classify those aspects. But when it comes to the actual data itself, even if you classified it as strictly confidential, if you classified that value of that tag data as confidential, what do you have or what tools are available that can um, take advantage of that data classification to do anything with it? Um, you know, maybe others are, are more knowledgeable in this, this area. I, I haven't seen anything. Most of it is, if it's not, if it, If it's not a Microsoft platform, it's hard to, you know, yeah. classify, you know, use tools to, to deal with the data classification. If you've got your historian data, if you've got, you know, other other data, you know, it, it's difficult to, you know, uh, apply data classification rules as far as that data leaving your environment. Yeah. I think we, I mean, I can speak from an ExxonMobil perspective. I think we've done a pretty good job at classifying our data from an internal standpoint. So we understand within our chemicals business, there's some, um, process data that we would consider intellectual property because it's associated with some proprietary ways that we run our chemicals business and we manage that data internally from an appropriate classification perspective. So the, the question is when you start to send that data externally to right. enable some of these capabilities, exactly. then how do you maintain the appropriate control of that data when it's now going outside of your company? Right. Because when it's just encapsulated into a a, a historian or a data lake that you're managing, that's one thing. You can classify it, you can control it, you can define the appropriate permissions, but when you start to send it externally to enable some of the capabilities here, mm -hmm. that's a different lens that you need to start to take a look at. Right. John? Are we yeah, John Cusimano with Deloitte. I'm going to build a little bit on Mark's question because there's been a lot of discussion on the panel already about risk and risk management, and Kenny, you, you, you said earlier you know, consequences are consequences. You can't really change those. It's how you manage the, 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 different, um, the different risks, whether that be physical security risks, cybersecurity risks, um, even equipment failure, random uh, failures that could lead to process safety. Ultimately, I think we're all generally concerned about process safety risks. Um, so my question is, as, a, as a, a, panels, a panelist with obviously very mature process safety programs you're required to by OSHA and EPA and so on, and I'm sure I've been doing it for 20, 30 years, and relatively new OT cybersecurity programs, but also you know, quite mature. What specific actions have, have your companies taken to, to leverage the mature discipline of process safety and process safety risk management and bring that into your OT, cyber OT, uh, process, uh, OT risk management programs? So I'm cheating because I've actually worked with John quite a bit on this over the years, um, but it is something that we are doing. And, and that is um, the, the analyses that you typically conduct in a process safety sort of way, right? Process hazards analysis, HAZOPS, LOPEZ, et cetera. I mean, there's a, a wealth of instructional knowledge and institutional knowledge about how to view risk from a particular perspective, not cyber. Um, and so one of the things we're doing it's not the only thing, but one of the things we're doing is we're taking that, that HAZOP sort of tool set and capability and thinking in terms of, you probably heard the phrase CHAZOP, <coughs> cyber hazards, uh, you know, et cetera. Um, CHAZOP. CHAZOP. Yep. And that's, that's out in the public I heard domain. That one. <laughs> I, I've, I've heard of the, the cyber PHAs, yeah. Yeah. And so um, to, to, to use those same tools and capabilities, is actually pretty powerful. Yep. And so that's one of the approaches we're taking. Yeah, so going back to our risk assessment discussion from earlier, so the, uh, our risk matrix incorporates the process safety uh, risk consequences on it. So when we look at from, from a cyber lens, when we do a cyber risk assessment, the consequences are those, not only the business financial consequences that you would see on an IT risk assessment, but also the process safety consequences that you would see as well. So very similar to a HAZOP type approach, putting that on the risk matrix so the 
the facility risk owner truly understands what risk they're accepting versus what risk they need to mitigate to try to the consequence will stay the same but what mitigations do they put in place to, to try to influence that probability and, and you know who's really really good at identifying consequences of impact it's the safety folks right they've been doing that forever and ever and ever to not leverage that information as part of your risk analysis is just missing a huge opportunity yeah, so in, in BSF I'm not going to go into the details of, of, of where we get with that if we want to talk offline we can we can talk but uh, we have a dedicated um, uh, security for safety um, initiative internally where we're we're working to um, uh, incorporate some of those uh, concerns or considerations into our PHA process John could you pass the gentleman over there had a question didn't you I assume he's still there I'm sorry if I'm missing anybody over here hi my name is Paul I'm uh, with BHS corrugated um, I think my question is really similar to to John's question I've seen uh, cybersecurity measures that are so robust that uh, major failures get missed because it's too cumbersome for experts to log in <clears throat> um, so how do you how do you mitigate the uh, the 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 risk of cybersecurity against the 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 new task that you're asking, you know, normal folks that don't understand ITO cybersecurity, they're just guys, they're, you know, technicians who've been working in the industry for 30 years. Uh, to me, that's a great question. I mean, it's something that we we talk about in our governance quite a bit. Again we can get infatuated with shiny objects and try to deploy those, but then you have to come up with the sustainability and support structure to make those effective. And at some of our facilities, the, the staffing that we have at those facilities, they're, they're not technology experts. Um, you know, especially when you start to get into some of the remote places that we do upstream operations. We have a very lean staffing strategy at those facilities and they're not IT people, they're not cybersecurity experts, they're not technical oh, experts. Years, yeah. So you have to have a fit for purpose approach for those facilities so you're appropriate, appropriately mitigating risk, but not also introducing new risk because you're asking an unqualified person to sustain a capability now um, that could actually have some unintended consequences. So it's, it's a challenging discussion and it's something I think we're all faced with, but you know, my, my cautious tale would be be very aware of the shiny object syndrome because just because something is marketed to have a certain value or capability, you have to be able to sustain that and you have to have the right skills in place to do it. And so if don't, you don't have the right skills, then you should question doing it. So uh, uh, let me see if I can repeat back your question if, if I'm understanding it accurately. There, there's also an operational value driver that says, hey, if I can get more visibility into these environments faster, I don't have to roll a truck, I don't have to get somebody out of their house at 3 a.m., et cetera, et cetera. That's usually the value driver that operations is asking for, right? Like, I, I can just roll out of bed and I'm on. Efficiencies of scale, right? Sure. And, and so the reason I wanted to be clear about that, because the answer, if I wasn't clear, wasn't going to make a lot of sense. So that is, that's a compromise, you know, the, there's compromises there, and it's a balancing act, and we, that's a huge part of my job day to day, is, you know, hey, the business needs an operational capability because it makes them more efficient or more capable or higher visibility or whatever, and we've got to find a way to do that in a secure way. I would say the probably leading piece of advice, having now gone through this quite a bit and suffered, you know, a lot of the, the compromise friction, is rather than come to me with your proposed solution, come to me with your proposed problem. Yes, yeah. I want to increase visibility, da 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 da, and let's work together coming up with the solution. Because we play whack a mole so often with, well, I want to do, I want to buy shiny objects. And it's like, well, well hold on, let's go back to it's why you're state. even trying. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Okay, we, we just a few minutes, but go ahead. You could, there's a fellow over there with a question. So. Yeah, so maybe a comment or two, then the, ultimately a question. And Mike Moody with BASL for our guest, Dollar General 
no, but uh, so, <laughs> but uh, uh, first, I, I like the discussion that's real, and so that's really good, and I really like the comments about the fit for purpose, because when you do look at the sites, you know, you have to support it, or it's no good, but, you know, as we increase automation, we have a lot of topics about even autonomous operations and things like this, we put a greater dependency on the, all these systems to work to even make product. If we look at the old style of making things, you had an operator at a keyboard and they could bypass a lot of failures out in the plants. And as we go more and more advanced, that gets harder to do. So we do put a lot more demand. So as we look at all these tools coming out, there's always, like you said, well, this can create risk, but maybe does it create value? Do you have a formal decision process where you value, evaluate the value versus the possible risk to see? Because sometimes there's cost in not doing something. And even if there's risk with it, there's still cost in not doing it. So you still got to take all that into consideration. So thank you. Well, he's asking from BSF, so uh, I'll turn well, to you I, first, I, and then I mean, I'll, uh, I'll turn about to About the most I can do is say yes. Yeah. We, we do. But getting into all those details would probably be a little beyond my purview and, and too long to discuss in the next two minutes. But yeah, if you track me down offline, we could probably get into more. I would say it goes back to the that risk assessment process, but then also doing the evaluations with our operations and engineering functions to make sure that it's appreciated that this is something that we could do, but should we do it? Because again, I'll go back to, there's a lot of things that we can do as an industry, but that doesn't mean that we should. And so those decisions need to be had with each individual company with the subject matter experts within that company. There's great ideas that are going to be coming at you from all directions within your own business. So you have to have the right subject matter experts at the table to make those informed decisions. And they won't get it right all the time, but at least it's going to be an informed decision that can be shared back within the organization. Yeah, and, and, and I guess you know, we work closely together. You know, timing, you know, getting the, the right people involved at a, at a, at a point in the decision-making process where you can evaluate uh, the the risk of doing it versus the risk of not doing it, whatever that it is, and um, and making sure that we have a, a, a good understanding of what is at stake, what what we're proposing, and and make sure we're aligned on terminology when we start you know bringing vendors in to discuss you know whatever this pr proposition is. Yeah, timing is everything. You really have to be. You really need to have these conversations at the beginning, because what happens is in operations, there is uh, what I call what I call perceived value momentum. So effectively, they've sold themselves <laughs> on the solution by the time they get to you, and now you've got so much to unwind. It's not even funny. That you have, is hard to stop. It is very hard to stop. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, on that note, uh, I, I'd like to really thank the panel. That I think it's been a wonderful panel. I hope they've enjoyed it as much as I, I know I've enjoyed listening to you guys debate, made it very easy to moderate. So thank you very much. <laughs>